the dark try to hide and steal you away death try to keep you inside of the grave the enemy fought you he tried but he lost you cannot be stopped when we cried for freedom you tore down the wall the weight of our burden you carried it all our fears and our fears hang dead on the cross you cannot be stopped Mover of mountains, breaker of chains, Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won, nothing can stand against our God. We stand on your victory, we shout out your praise. Miracle work, you're mighty to say. Awesome in power, relentless in love. Oh, oh, you cannot be stopped, cause you're the mover of mountains, breaker of chains. Jesus is trying over. that can stop our God there's nothing that can stop our God no there's nothing that can stop our God there is nothing there is nothing there's nothing that can stop our we cannot be stopped there's nothing that can stop our God no Nothing that can stop our God. There is no.
Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, once again to uh, this weekend's online service. We're so glad that you're here. Whether you're part of our Tuvers family here locally here in Fort Collins or you're somewhere around the country that uh, you're finding encouragement in our ministry, we're just we're so grateful. We're so humbled that you're a part of this. Uh, as we uh, prepare these services each week, as I prepare to teach, um, our prayer, my simple prayer every week is that um, that you would be encouraged and equipped and strengthened in the authority and the power of God's Word. And so as we open the Scriptures again this morning, I pray all of those uh, things uh, over you, your mind and heart, your life, uh, as we open the Scriptures. Uh, you're not going to believe this probably, but I think, I think we're going to get through Mark, 11, or Mark 12 today. Uh, we've been uh, in this journey in Mark 11 and Mark 12 for quite a few weeks uh, Mark 11 begins with the uh, triumphant entry. We renamed that the humble entry of Jesus on the baby donkey. Uh, and then Mark, uh, at the end of Mark 11 and Mark 12, Jesus is engaging, as you know, if you've been journeying with us, um, every day for a number of days uh, in the temple in Jerusalem. 
And uh, we've been uh, spending our time on this uh, for, um, for the reason is we don't want to miss anything. We want to make sure that we're understanding the full revelation of what Jesus is doing uh, here because it's really, really, really radical uh, for our faith and our journey as followers of Jesus. And so we've been slow on purpose, but we will get into chapter uh, 13 uh, today. Um, as you know, uh, this is uh, right before Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, he's in the temple. Day after day after day, Jesus being challenged again and again by uh, kind of an onslaught of people that are political and religious oppressors, uh, Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians and teachers of the law and chief priests. Um, and it's been all of those interactions. And each time Jesus has been challenged, his words and his actions have been consistent. They have been the same. Uh, language like, you are wrong, you don't know the scriptures, uh, you are hypocrites. Um, all this all this religion, all this oppression, all this uh, cultic reality of the Old Covenant temple system and the corruption that was happening in the actual temple, all this manipulation, all this fear-based um, control of people is ending by the way of Jesus. Uh, even the great temple, this great temple on this great temple Mount that uh, was built by Herod the Great. Even the physical temple is coming down because God is doing a brand new thing in Jesus. And we need to keep that in mind. We need to keep in mind today all the things that we've been reading and studying and learning over really the last couple of months in Mark 11 and Mark 12. Uh, the overall context of Mark 11 and 12 needs to inform how we understand uh, and translate for our lives, our faith in our lives, what Jesus is saying in our passage today. So where we're going to be today is Mark 12, uh, verse 38, uh, and we're going to go through Mark 13, uh, verse 2. So that will be the passage, and uh, I've just titled it, uh, Thrown Down, uh, which is what Jesus says in Mark 13, 1 and 2, that all of the stones of this great temple will be thrown down. Um, do you remember, before we read the passage, do you remember what Jesus did uh, the first time he came into Jerusalem and to the temple uh, right after his humble entry on the foal of a donkey? Um, do you remember what he did? He, he denounced it all. He, uh, was, um, he was driving people out of the temple. He was turning over the corrupt money tables. He was calling the whole corruption a den of robbers. Do you remember what Jesus said the very next day as he came back to the temple with his disciples? He told the disciples these words. He said, have faith in God, emphasis on the word faith, belief, that if you say to this mountain as he's looking at the temple mount, as he's looking at the actual physical temple and all that it represents, if you say to this mountain, be thrown into the sea and believe... So we have faith and we have belief. If you say it, if you have faith and you believe it, it will be done. This is the saving faith. This is saved by faith language of the new covenant, not the, not the doing, not the rules and the ritual and the doing of the old covenant. Now, after all these multiple days of being in the temple and all these interactions with all of Jesus's opponents, uh, Jesus in our passage today will leave the temple for the last time. And as he did when he showed up a few days prior denouncing the temple, he will denounce the temple again as he leaves. He's denouncing the pride and the hypocrisy of its leaders. And he tells them again that every stone is coming down. Uh, what we're going to start with uh, is we're going to look at um, really six diabolical um, really realities of what's happened uh, in the temple and its leadership. And so as we read through the passage, uh, I want you to kind of think about all these things that Jesus is uh, kind of pointing out. He's kind of calling this out 
of the the scribes and the teachers of the law. So let's read this and then we'll continue to unpack it again. Mark 12, starting in verse 38. Uh, And in his teaching, Jesus again, he's in the temple, he's teaching, people are around. He said, beware of the scribes or beware of the teachers of the law who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces. They, they enjoy wearing their long robes and they enjoy getting these special greetings in the marketplaces by the common folk. And they have the best seats in the synagogues. The front seats belong to them and they have the best seats, the places of honor at feasts. Verse 40 Beware of the scribes who devour widows' houses and for a pretense or for a show make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And then Jesus sits down. He says these words. He's almost finished with all the things that he is about to say. They're literally about to leave the temple. He sits down. Verse 41, he sat down opposite the treasury and he began to watch people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums and a poor widow came and put two small copper coins which makes a penny. You might know this story as the widow's mite. The King James Version uh, translates as two mites. These two really insignificant copper coins, which make a penny. Verse 43, and he called his disciples to him. They're all sitting. They're watching what's happening. Calls the disciples to him. And he said to them, truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put everything she had, all that she had to live on. In chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, And as he came out of the temple, they're leaving the temple. Jesus and his disciples are leaving the temple for the last time. And one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful, wonderful buildings, speaking about the physical reality of the temple. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Do you see all of this, all of these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. This is the word of God. This is our passage for us uh, this morning. Again, I pray that as we unpack this, it would be encouraging and equipping and strengthening uh, in your faith. Uh, He has denounced the temple at his first arrival. He tells his disciples if they have faith, it will be thrown into the sea. And as he leaves the temple for the last time, he denounces it again. Um, I think as we think about these words, um, Jesus is telling his disciples, those that are following him, he is saying to them, speaking about the, the teachers of the law, speaking about legalism, speaking about fear and control and manipulation. And he is saying to his disciples, be careful, be aware, be careful of people like this, be careful of sin like this, be careful of any system of belief, any religious system that would cause you to follow God, not out of, not out of belief, not out of faith, but out of fear. This is what Jesus is cautioning the disciples in this day, and it's what the Word of God is inviting us to be cautious of in our day as well. So I want to point out these six things and just talk about each one briefly. The first thing that Jesus calls out of the scribes is how they like to parade around in long robes. One of the things that I tell young couples when they uh, get engaged and they ask me to do their uh, officiate their wedding, uh, I tell them two things. I say, we'll meet together, but there's two conditions. One, Uh, I want you to walk through uh, an intentional premarital process with me. And two, I say, I won't wear a robe. 
And I just want to say to all of you, this is biblical evidence that we don't have to wear robes. We don't have to get all dressed up in robes. Anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, what the robes were uh, really um, isn't that important, what they look like, kind of what they were. Uh, what's important to point out here is why they wore them. And they wore them to set themselves apart as more special, as higher than others, to augment their authority. Um, Jesus' authority, his authority is connected to his person. He's the Son of God. He's, uh, and his teaching, he, he teaches as the Son of God, the, the God-man, the one who came to rescue us and teach us and lead us and save us. So Jesus' authority connected to his person and his teaching, but theirs, the scribes, the teachers of the law, theirs is connected to their position and their clothing that, that they used to flaunt themselves uh, in hunger for their own authority and honor. Um, robes in this context is what Jesus is talking about. We could put lots of other things in our context that we use to flaunt, to position ourselves as better than or higher than others. Certainly clothes, certainly cars, houses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The point is, are we using material things to position ourselves as better than and higher than others in a prideful way? C.S. Lewis calls pride the great sin that all other sins flow from. Be careful be careful of those who parade around in long robes. Second thing Jesus says, be careful of the scribes who uh, demand a human adulation from those who have lesser status. Uh, in John chapter uh, 5, if you remember the story, Jesus heals um, uh, a man who's lame at the pool of Bethesda, and he healed him on the Sabbath. And this, this caused the Jewish leadership to literally want to kill Jesus for healing this man on the Sabbath. John 5, uh, verse 40, he says, You refuse to come to me that you may have life. You, you're going to your rules and your rituals and your traditions. You refuse to come to me. This man came to me for life and I gave it to him. And he says in verse 44 in John chapter 5, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek glory that comes from the only God? You demand the human adulation from people. He calls it out. Beware of people. Like this, Jesus says to his disciples, be careful, beware of people that demand the VIP seating. Uh, they, they love recognition more than they love God. And Jesus has been calling his disciples, and we've seen this in the Gospel of Mark. He's been calling his disciples of the exact opposite of the teachers of the law, of their ego and their pride and how they flaunt themselves and how they demand VIP seating. A few things that you remember us talking about, famous words of Jesus about what it means to be a disciple and a follower of Christ is this, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant and a servant of all. Many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Whoever would be great among you, remember when he told the disciples this in Mark chapter 9, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. This is the exact opposite of the attitude and the way that the scribes behave. They demand VIP seating. Jesus isn't done. Fourthly, beware, be careful of people like this. They devour widows' houses. This situation that Jesus is pointing out uh, most likely has to do with the, with the temple's leadership, their dishonest management of the estates of widows. Their husbands obviously have passed away. They have been widowed and they are mismanaging. They are dishonest in how they are mismanaging widows' houses. And in doing so, they are taking advantage of widows for their own financial gain. Jesus says, you're devouring widows' houses. Uh, write this down, Isaiah chapter 10. I would encourage you, go, go read Isaiah chapter 10 a little later. 
uh, today. It's a stern word from the Lord through the prophet Isaiah for this kind of abuse of widows uh, to their own destruction. They parade around in long robes. They demand human adulation. They demand VIP seating. They devour widows' houses. Jesus continues to go on. They, they say these long prayers for a pretense. The NIV translates it for a show. It's inauthentic. It's hypocrisy um, in its purest form. And he's calling it out. He's calling it inauthentic. They're long prayers and they're flowy robes is just another way their pride is showing itself. These are, these are warnings that we would be wise to think about, to consider in our own lives. Is any of this kind of pride seeping its way into my mind and my heart? To think about this and to allow the kindness of God, the grace of God, the love of God, the kindness of God to lead us to repentance where any pride like any of this might be seeping into our lives. Do I, do I in any way, do we, do you in any way, do we parade around to set ourselves higher and better than others? This is diabolical. Do I, do we, do we, do we seek the the applause of man? Do we seek human adulation from others so that we feel puffed up in our own ego? Is there any of that in me? Is there any of that in you? Lord, show me so this can be rooted out of me. This is not Jesus in the way of the kingdom of God. Do I, do we, do we position for first in line at the expense of someone else? Do we, do we clamor and fight for the best seats? Do I, do we in any way, is there any mismanagement of money in any way for my own gain? This is not Jesus. Jesus is saying, be careful of people who operate like this. Be careful if that seeps into your own life. This is not the way of Jesus in the kingdom of heaven. Do I, do we attempt to be showy in any way with our spirituality so that people might be impressed by how we pray. These are not things that Jesus is encouraging. These are obviously things that Jesus is calling out in the pride and the hypocrisy of the teachers of the law. We would be wise to heed the same warning that if any of this by way of our flesh, by way of the lies of the enemy of the world that is seeping in in any way and Jesus's kindness can help us see so that we can repent and change. Well, in the next verses, uh, Jesus will point out the sixth way that the temple and its leadership and its corruption is operating diabolically. And here's how this is happening. The sixth way he's telling the disciples to be careful. He creates the scene. He sits down, he brings the disciples, and they begin to watch people give money into the treasury. It's the temple tax that's been put on the people. And if you're like me, when you heard me read this passage a few minutes ago, uh, perhaps you've kind of always thought of this brief story of the widow's offering of her two mites or her two copper coins really as a model for how we are to give sacrificially to God. Maybe you've read it that way. If you've grown up in church, chances are pretty good that you've probably heard this taught as a, as a model um, of sacrificial giving to God and that Jesus is honoring what's going on here. Uh, but to understand uh, this passage this way, to understand that Jesus is taking a moment here to teach his disciples about offering and giving, it removes, um, it removes it from the context of Mark 11 and 12. Uh, remember, the whole context of Mark 11 and 12 is Jesus denunciating the temple and its leadership. I don't believe uh, that Jesus is using this widow, this poor widow, whose house has been devoured by the temple leadership, 
that she has given literally the last two coins she has. I don't believe that Jesus is using this as a message to the disciples about giving. Jesus is not commending her faith. He's actually condemning the corrupt system for the fear that they have placed on this poor widow to literally give the last two coins that she has. What the widow is doing here in this passage is to be lamented. She had been so controlled, so manipulated by religion and the fear tactics of the teachers of the law that she was literally giving away the last two coins to her name. She was a widow whose house was literally being devoured, emptied. Everything she had was gone. It's lamentable that she was giving her last two coins to the temple that Jesus had already called in Mark 11 a den of robbers. We know that these two copper coins um, were worth about 1 64th of a day's wage. So a denarius was worth one, a one day's wage. These little copper coins were worth about one sixty-fourth of that. And so if you, if someone makes $15 an hour and they work an eight hour day, uh, what that means, how that translates for us is each of her coins was worth about a dollar fifty. So she was putting in the last $3 that she owned into the temple treasury. How how afraid she must have been by the teachers of the law to give all that she had to her name. She must have been very afraid. If we want to understand new covenant giving and giving out of a place of generosity and cheerfulness. We don't come to what Jesus says here in Mark 12. We could look at what Paul teaches in 2 Corinthians 8 and 2 Corinthians 9. This is a context about new covenant cheerful giving, about giving out of generosity and gratitude out of our hearts, that our hearts are stirred uh, to generosity, to give freely out of our hearts because we're so grateful for what God has done for us and we want to be a part of the mission of God's kingdom. When you, when you read uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, the word uh, grace, you can go look at this later, the word grace recurs over and over and over again in these two chapters, 8, 9 or so times. Uh, and what Paul's saying here is that giving is referred to as a grace. It's not about fear and manipulation and control and giving out of guilt and fear. It's about giving out of a place that grace has been given to me and I operate out of that grace with generosity and cheerfully. God empowers us to be cheerful givers. And so what Jesus is showing the disciples in Mark 12 isn't cheerful giving. What he's showing them is fearful giving by this widow and they they watch and they see the evidence of fear-based manipulation and control right before their very eyes and the temple was set up to be a place um, where widows would be cared for they would be taken care of like the temple treasury tax was to be used to take care of widows and what it had become uh, was a place where the treasury that was set up to help her and now is taking uh, from her. She she should not have even been there. She should not have even been there. The new community, the new covenant, the new reality of God following God, following Jesus, the Son of God. The new community of God is centered on Jesus and is opposed to all six of the things that we just mentioned that Jesus points out in the temple in our passage. The new community of Jesus places priority on people and their lives rather than on rituals and rules and robes and fear and religious showmanship. 
The new community of Jesus is about freedom, having an identity in Christ, radical forgiveness, and being free in God's grace, not by fear and by bondage. That is what Jesus has come to inaugurate, and that is why Jesus over and over and over again in Mark 11 and 12 has been denouncing the temple and its leaders over and over and over. I'm thinking right now off the cuff of an old DC talk song, God is doing a new thing. God is doing a new thing. And I think in the song they said, thang, you know, because it's a rap song, you guys. You guys with me? Are you laughing? Okay, anyway. Spade is laughing. Spade is laughing. God is doing a new thing, and I like it. Anyway, uh, this is the new thing, the denunciation of the temple and the beginning of the new way of grace. And so they're leaving the temple. Last time Jesus leaves the temple. We're getting so close to his crucifixion. Here's what happens. I want to read these two verses again. And he came out of the temple. One of the disciples again was like, look, teacher, Look at these wonderful buildings and these wonderful stones. And Jesus said, do you see it? Are you looking at it? Do you see the great buildings? Here's the reality. There will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Disciples had just heard Jesus denounce the temple and its leadership over the course of like two or three days. And still, for some reason, as they leave, they still can't help but to speak of these wonderful physical stones and these buildings, this great building of the temple, to which Jesus says, look at it. I'm telling you, this is all coming down. All of this is is over. Uh, Think about this for a second. Who built that temple? When they're leaving the great temple on the Temple Mount of Zion, who built it? It was Herod the Great. Herod the Great rebuilt the temple. Well, how did Herod the Great build it. He built it on the backs of slaves and of the robbing of people. And the temple wasn't to be lauded anymore. The temple and its corrupt system was to be destroyed. Again, the new community centered on Jesus was being built with different stones. No longer physical stones, but what Jesus called living stones. I want to read a passage out of 1 Peter. Peter was here. Peter was there every day. He heard all of this. He heard what Jesus said in uh, chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. He writes his first letter. I'm just going to read these verses. This is 1 Peter 2, verses 4 uh, to 9. Peter says to the believers, the followers, the disciples, As you come to Jesus... A living stone who was rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, you yourselves, each one of us, you, me, each person that believes and trusts and follows Jesus, you yourselves are like living stones. You are being built up as a spiritual house. Not a physical house on a temple mount, but a spiritual house. This is the new covenant church to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scriptures, behold, I am laying in Zion, Zion, Mount Zion, Old Covenant Temple. Are you with me right now? I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone. This isn't a physical stone. It's Jesus, the cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Verse 7, so the honor is for you who believe. The honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you, again, speaking to the believers, the followers, Peter saying, but to each one of us, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, not like the old covenant priesthood, a royal priesthood priesthood in Jesus, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Hallelujah. People who believe and follow Jesus are the living stones and living stones. This is the church. 
the church, we say this all the time, the church isn't a building. It's not a place. The church is the people and living stones. Those who know Christ, those who have been given the stamp of the Holy Spirit, they come together to become the new temple of the Holy Spirit here on earth. Old covenant, the temple, one temple, one place, one mount, one city, new covenant, church of Jesus Christ, the temple of God is everywhere. It is anywhere and everywhere where the body of Christ, where the living stones come and commune together under the name of Jesus. Bringing heaven to earth. Remember the Lord's prayer? Bringing heaven to earth is not building physical temples with physical stones. Bringing heaven to earth is the living stones being built into a spiritual house. It's building the church of Jesus that brings hope to people and brings healing to people's lives by the way we love and care and serve and bless and peace to people and comfort to people. The hands and feet of Jesus, literally the living stones. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Literally the living stones bringing comfort to those who are mourning, reminding them of the presence of Jesus and provision that the church is to be a place of provision and care for people so that they receive provision from the body of Christ, and justice, and redemption, and restoration. This is what we are to build. And love, and grace, and freedom. The church, the call of the church, our call as Two Rivers Church isn't to be a, a holy little huddle in this place. The church is to be a people, living stones who are living on mission with the message of freedom and hope and healing, who aren't afraid uh, to get gritty in the lives of people and to build the church of Jesus in our day. Living on mission is living with a purpose. Living on mission as living stones is living with intentionality, with gritty effort as we follow Jesus. Following Jesus isn't saying, look, look at this physical thing that we built for Jesus. Following Jesus is saying, look what Jesus is building in us and now through us by his grace, not for our glory, but for the glory of God. So church family, as we close, hear this Hear this today. Jesus is our cornerstone. And you are one of his living stones. And being a living stone, it is not about showmanship. Being a living stone is about discipleship. Again, remember what Jesus said. If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of God. All. Do you know the most spirit-filled people I know? You've heard me say this before. The most spirit-filled people I know are the humble servants that serve and serve and serve. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Being a living stone isn't about showmanship. It is about discipleship. It is about servanthood, not by fear. Not by manipulation, but by his grace that empowers us to go, that empowers us to be conduits of Jesus where we live, where we work, where we play. And so my question to you today is, where are you serving? Where are you serving? And I'm not asking you these questions to try to put any pressure on anyone. That's not how we roll. That's not how I roll. That's not how we do things at Two Rivers. It always operates out of freedom. It's always, I love because God first loved me. So God has empowered me to go and love and serve. Where are you loving? Where are you serving as a conduit of blessing? Who are you serving? Who is God calling you to serve? How are you serving? What does it look like for you? What kind of intentionality maybe needs to uh, become a part of how you think about being a servant and living on mission. 
God loves, we talked about this already, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, God loves a cheerful giver in our time, in our talent, and in our treasure. Faith living is cheerful giving with our time and our talents and our servants as we give unto the Lord. I would say this to you as uh, the reason that we say that we are humble to receive your free will offerings. There's there's a distinction. It's uh, we're not we don't want to take offerings as a church, but we are humbled and honored and blessed to receive your free will offering of your time, of your talent, of your treasure to continue to grow our ministry, to disciple and encourage our church, and to reach more people, to invite more people to come and be with us as we follow. Jesus. Uh, We don't take an offering, we receive it. We are simply conduits of your generosity to build the church of Jesus here in Fort Collins and beyond. So once again, I hope and pray that these words, this time together has been an encouragement to you, that it has been equipping, that it has been strengthening, that it is light to your feet, and a lamp to your path. Um, Let me pray for us. Lord, for each person that took the time to listen to this message and be here right now, whenever it is, I just pray the blessing of Jesus over, over them. I pray the love and the peace and the comfort and the hope and the healing and the empowerment and the provision faith to believe the words of Jesus, this liberating message of freedom that Jesus has given us. Lord, would it change us? Lord, by your kindness, change us. We want want pride to be rooted out of us. We want to know you more. We want to follow you. We want to honor you with our lives. Lord, grow our ministry, we pray. Lord, grow our ministry here. Uh, so that more people can be encouraged and strengthened and to join us on this mission. Uh, Lord, we have work to do and we are grateful, we are cheerful to give of our time and our talent and our treasure to be a part of your work in our city. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for listening. Um, If you do desire to bring free will offerings, Lord, we, we humbly receive those. You can send that to our P.O. box. You can give online. There'll be another slide at the end of the service that will direct you if that's something that you uh, haven't done and would like to start doing. Uh, God bless you as we uh, wrap our service with one more song of worship together. see heaven invading this place. I see angels praising your holy name. And I sing praises, I sing praises, give you honor, worthy Jesus. And I see glory falling in this place.
All the glory and honor is yours, God. You deserve it. We give it to you today. All the glory. Everything good in our lives. Lord, it's because of you. All the glory is yours. We love you. We're thankful for you this morning. 